So Dean George and Dr. Gordon, would you like to go ahead and start? Sure. Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Sophia George. I'm the Dean here at the Christine Lynn College of Nursing at Florida Atlantic University. I'd like to officially welcome you to the launch event for Creative Nursing Journal's new edition entitled Thinking Like a Nurse, Intent and Impact of Caring. The FAU College of Nursing is pleased to host this virtual event with Marty Lewis Huntstinger, Editor-in-Chief of Creative Nursing and Dr. John Nelson, our guest, their guest editor. We're also looking forward to hearing from thought leaders across the globe about caring science. And for just a few minutes, I'd just like to share my screen here. So just to tell you a little bit about our college, our, our college's mission is to advance caring science and prepare the next generation of caring and compassionate nurses. Caring science is at the root of our approach of learning and community service from our nationally ranked undergraduate and graduate programs to our innovative research, to our nurse-led community health centers and our memory and wellness center. We study the meaning, practice the art and live caring day to day. Our philosophy of caring is reflected in Sister Roach's six C's of caring, which some of you are familiar with, I'm sure. Compassion, competence, confidence, conscience, commitment, and comportment. Nursing makes a unique contribution to society by nurturing the wholeness of persons and environment and caring. Our college has academic programs in Boca Raton, Davie Campus, Harbor Branch, throughout South Florida. And I'd just like to share a land statement um, with you. Their generations of indigenous people and tribes have resided on the lands where the College of Nursing and FAU's campuses are located throughout the Southeast Florida. And we honor indigenous history and state our commitment to protect these lands and people. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement statement to learn more about the College of Nursing's academic programs, research and community, community service on our website. I will now ask Dr. Shirley Gordon, uh, FAU's college professor of nursing and a researcher, nurse scientist, and a fellow caring science um, scholar to say a few words about her work and about caring science. Thank you, Dean George, and hello everyone. I am a professor of nursing in the Christine Lynn College of Nursing and a board certified advanced holistic nurse and health and wellness nurse coach. I coordinate the Advanced Holistic Master's Concentration and direct our initiative for intentional health. Today, we will hear from thought leaders on caring science from around the world. At FAU, we define caring science as the body of knowledge arrived at through intentional research and theory development focused on the relationship of caring to health, healing, and well being of the whole person within the context of family, community, society, and the global environment. My research focuses on caring for persons experiencing stigmatized conditions and caring for the environment, including the impact of long-term exposure to harmful algal blooms on human health. For over 40 years at FAU, we have created and offered programs of study grounded in holistic caring-based curriculum. We are the only college in the country to have all undergraduate and graduate programs endorsed by the American Holistic Nurses Association. Our caring informs how we study nursing, how we practice our profession, and how we interact with others throughout our lives. We study caring as lived in the ordinariness of life and as the central domain of nursing through the use of nursing situations. We recognize each individual as caring and uniquely connected to others and the environment. I'm privileged to welcome you to this virtual launch event on the intent and impact of caring and to introduce Marty Lewis Hunziger, the Editor-in-Chief of creative nursing. Welcome, Marty. Thank you so much, dear. And I just wanna thank Florida Atlantic University and you folks for hosting this. This is just a wonderful gift that you're giving to the nursing community and the healthcare community and really the whole, the whole universe. On behalf of Creative Nursing, a journal of values, issues, experience and collaboration. That's our whole name. 
I welcome you to this celebration of the publication of Creative Nursing, Volume 28, Number 1, Thinking Like a Nurse, Intent and Impact of Caring. This issue is about the science that is foundational to what we do. Nursing's reputation as an emotional, touchy-feely calling devoid of science theory and even the need for us to be sustained as individuals is historical, unfounded and unfair. Naming, describing, measuring and analyzing the science of our caring is crucial for the future of our profession and is the foundation of thinking like a nurse. We call this issue intent and impact of caring, honoring the principle from conversations about anti-racism that in the end, it is not what we intend to do that matters. What does our caring achieve? I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge by name some of the people without whom this issue of the journal wouldn't be what it is. We have many people registered. So even in gallery view, I won't be able to see everyone at once. But if I name you, please wave and know that we love you. So our amazing editorial board members, some are here today, past and present, Cyrus Bethagia, Bridget Carter, Terry Grainer, Barbara Green, Jen Guancy, Joan Carnes, Susan Lampy, Heidi Orsted, Mary Colarudis, Marie Manthe, Jim Meyer, Teddy Potter, Jane Robles, Larry Savet, Tammy Singfield Mori, Rebecca Smith, Lorraine Stiefel, Lori Steffen, Chris Subi, Dory Taylor Sullivan, Roxanne Wilson, and Atisham Yunus. Our champions, past and present, at Springer Publishing Diana Osborne, Megan Larkin, Corin Thomas, Matt Zimmerman, Adam Etkin, Jim Costello, Andrew Benny and Beth Berry. Creative Healthcare Management is the healthcare consulting company that has sponsored the journal for over 25 years. And I'd like to honor those in attendance. I know Jane Felgen is here who is celebrating her 25th year with the company. She's the one that I've seen so far that is here, but there may be others that have joined us as well. We have so many rich articles to discuss that there won't be time for a formal Q&A during this event. We encourage you to reach out to the authors personally by email with questions and comments. I've posted the list of the authors, the corresponding authors' emails in the chat. It's at the very top of the chat. Um, also, when you read the whole issue, the corresponding author's emails are at the end of each article. The digital version of this whole issue can be found on our journal's website, and that that URL is also in the chat. There's an annotated table of contents that briefly describes each article. That document, along with the recording of this launch event as soon as it's ready, sometimes it takes a week or more to do post-production before the recording could be posted. But when it's ready, that recording will be posted at the Creative Healthcare Management website, on the Christine Lynn College of Nursing at Florida Atlantic University website, and on our Creative Nursing Facebook and Twitter sites. Those are all in the chat. So now beginning our discussion of our articles, our guest editor for this issue, it was a slam dunk figuring out who should be this guest editor. John Nelson, PhD, MS, RN. John is CEO of Healthcare Environment, a company that specializes in predictive analytics to improve outcomes in healthcare. John holds a master's degree in statistics and a PhD in nursing. He has worked with more than 400 organizations in more than 46 countries. He is co-editor with Gene Watson of Measuring Caring, International Research on Caritas as Healing, and co-editor with Jane Felgen and Marianne Hozak of Using Predictive Analytics to Improve Healthcare Outcomes. This book is the winner of the American Journal of Nursing's Book of the Year Award in Informatics in 2021. John will present two articles exemplifying caring science. Welcome, John. Thank you, Marty, and thank you for this opportunity to be the guest editor for um, this issue of Creative Nursing. And thank you to FAU for hosting this event as well. It's um, such an honor to have you host, host this. So over the next 10 to 12 minutes, I'm going to present two articles. 
as Marty had identified, and for the special issue of creative nursing, and it focuses on caring science and concepts of caring. Now, the first study was written by seven authors from uh, four different countries, but I'm representing those seven authors, and they're all listed in the article, so I encourage you to uh, review the article and the authors that I am um, co-authoring with. So the first author is a three country study and it's actually a replication of an eight country study that we did in 2019. Now we use structural equation model to study five constructs to understand how they relate to each other. And we call this the profile of caring. Now the second article was also written by me but it uses uh, data from the eight country study in a secondary, secondary analytics, ana, analysis. And uh, I looked at the composition of caring for self and caring of managers. So both of these articles have the same background. So I'm just gonna take about a minute and a half to just review some of the background for both of these articles. Now the re research from both of these articles is possible because of an international collaborative called the Caring Science International Collaborative. Now that formed in 2019. Now I must say that this is not the first international collaborative that I've been part of. Um, there's other information that um, precedes this collaborative that has been utilized in this collaborative. So, but I just want to recognize this current formation from 2019. And it is nurses from 14 countries that have been studying an important profile of nurses, which is comprised of five constructs important for nurses, well being, and professional effectiveness. <clears throat> now, I should note that this profile of caring is applicable to anyone that takes care of a patient or is in clinical care, but these two articles we studied. Uh, nurses specifically. So that's why I'm addressing nurses, but it is applicable to uh, more than just nurses. So within that uh, profile, it includes the examination of nurses report of how they are caring for themselves, their report of how their manager is um, demonstrating caring behaviors to them, their clarity of role, their clarity of the system and their job satisfaction. And it's a six dimension um, construct of job satisfaction, which I'll talk more about in just a little bit. Now, the work of this is a culmination of research over 21 years. And there are two sources that um, have much of the information from these collaboratives. Now, the first one is, uh, she talked about it. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe you can't see that. Anyway, it's um, it's it's uh, the measuring caring international research on caritas as healing, and that was published in 2012. Now that's 81 contributors from nine countries, but it has a nice compilation of the very beginning of our work. And then the second one that she identified that was the um, book of the year by American Journal of Nursing, the Using Predictive Analytics to Improve Healthcare Outcomes. That one has 45 contributors from um, 12 countries. And that has uh, that was published in 2021, but that has a lot of the um, other research from these um, international collaboratives. So article one, that's in the section from the guest editor. And so the title of this article is called The Profile of Caring, an Internationally Tested Model to Assess and Support Nurses During Pandemic. Now, this is a replication study from chapter 16 in the 2021 book where we looked at the profile of caring. But in this particular article, we review just three countries. We had some additional hospitals from Turkey, but we added Russia, nurses from Russia and from um, Serbia. Now we wanted to understand the five constructs in this profile of caring because oftentimes in hospital data management, we look at the patient data and we look at the system data, but we often don't, or maybe even always uh, fail to study the profile of those who are caring for the patient. What is the impact of 
uh, on outcomes when staff care for self, have a caring manager, have clarity of role, clarity of system, and job satisfaction. That's yet to be known. And the international collaborative that I've mentioned, that's what we're trying to understand is what is the impact on the staff and the patient when the uh, profile of caring is high. Now, within this um, eight country study and now this um, three country study, we utilized um, something called structural equation modeling to study the relationships of these uh, five constructs and how they related to um, each other. And we utilized not only structural equation modeling or analytics, but we utilize theory as well to guide our thinking and our um, decision-making as we were reducing the 97 item profile of caring down to 35 items. Now, the theories that we used in this current article was Gene Watson's theory of transpersonal caring. Now, in the eight country study, there were a couple of caring theories that we utilized, but in this particular um, three country study, we only used Gene Watson's theory of transpersonal caring. We also used theories of clarity that were addressed by Felgen and Nelson in chapter two of the 2021 book by Wiley that I've um, been talking about. And then for job satisfaction, we used uh, socio-technical systems theory. And according to that theory, it proposes that both social and technical dimensions are essential for job satisfaction. The social factors include patient care, co-worker relationships, and communication with the manager. The technical factors include professional growth, autonomy, and organizational rewards. Now, I don't have time to go through all the scientific testing of these instruments in the profile of caring, but we have done extensive examination of the reliability, the validity, and the invariance testing. And in this study, we looked at 1,216 nurses that included, three, included 331 from Russia, 489 from Serbia, and 396 from Turkey. And what we found is that the model of the profile of carrying the 35 items had good model fit in these three countries, just like it did in the eight country study from 2019. And in summary, what we found was that caring for self and caring of manager had a positive relationship with clarity of role and clarity of system. But we also found that caring for self and caring of manager also predicted job satisfaction. Now, what was interesting to find was caring of self had a stronger relationship with clarity than did caring of manager. The power in using a structural equation model is you're able to study the multiple relationships within the same model, which informs operationally. Now, when we compared the scores of Russia with Serbia and um, Turkey, we found that Russia had higher, higher scores than the other two countries in all of the domains except caring for self. Now, in our research of why this might be, we actually found that in the pandemic, job satisfaction scores increased because nurses identified what their role really was and the importance of their role in this pandemic. So job satisfaction was actually found to increase. So we proposed that that might be. Now, the other thing that we would like to know is how is a high profile of caring or high caring for self caring of manager, clarity of role and system and job satisfaction, how does that impact resilience? We need to study that more deeply. And we're going to be studying that in the next round of studies that is launching this year. The other thing we would like to understand is how does the profile of caring impact patient outcomes? We hypothesize that those have a high profile of caring will also have high patient outcomes. Now, the second article um, is in the articles and X essays section. And the second study was written just by me, but it is premised on this uh, eight country study. So it does come from the same database. The title of this 
article that reviews this secondary analysis is called Using the Profile of Caring, Measuring Nurses Caring for Self and Caring by Their Unit Manager. Now, the data was derived from the 2019 study, and what we wanted to understand is why when we reduce the items um, within the structural equation model, why did six items survive for caring for self and caring of manager? And what were the similarities and the differences? And what we found was there were five items in both caring for self and caring of the manager using Watson's theory that survived the final um, analysis, meaning that um, they had higher relevance uh, than um, the ones that were excluded. Now, it was interesting to find that five of those 10 caring processes proposed by Watson's theory were retained by both of the instruments, but each of them had a unique retention of one of the items, which informs us that the composition for each type of caring relationship is not necessarily the same. And utilizing data in this way helps inform us how we can implement um, various types of relationships as we're trying to improve the profile of caring. So that's in brief, and I encourage you to read the full article uh, in this issue of Creative Nursing. Thank you. So thank you, John. When I said that it was a no-brainer or a slam dunk choosing John for this issue, I want to tell you, for those of you who haven't heard this before, John is a nurse statistician. When I tell people about him and what he does, that's the title that I give him is a, he's a nurse statistician. And one of his statements that is in my heart always about the profession that I, means so much to me has to do with patient safety. Not just do patients feel safe, are they safe? Do bad things not happen to them? And what John said was the strongest predictor, the strongest statistical predictor of patient safety is a caring, contextualizing nurse interacting in kindness. I might even, I'll put that in the chat when I have time because that quote just is, you know, a lamp unto my feet. So I am now pleased to introduce Barbara Stillwell, PhD, MSE, RN, FRCN. Barbara is a global workforce consultant based in the UK and was guest editor of our issue, Professional Practice in a Changing World, Radical Advocacy. That was a few years ago when we were just as radical as we are now. She will introduce her co-author, Constance Newman, and present Nurses Learning to be Powerful Leaders, What Will It Take? Thank you so much, Marty. Um, hello, everybody. It's really great to be here. And thank you for the invitation, the opportunity. Thank you to the University of Florida as well for hosting us. Um, Constance Newman and I, we're delighted to be here. We're going to share uh, the five minutes that we have, try and stick to time. I'm just going to do a quick introduction to the paper. Um, and all we can do really is give you an overview of the shape of the paper and, and you know what it's about and we really hope this will tempt you seriously to go and look at it and the rest of the journal which is absolutely fantastic so our paper really is a milestone along a long journey i think and it, it began actually not long after marty i did i was guest editor for you and jane salvage and i did um uh, an editorial, I think. I think it was both of us, or maybe it was only me. But anyway, uh, it was uh, along very similar lines that, you know, nursing is often undervalued for the complex problem solving scientific process that it is, as well as all the emotional intelligence it, it, it takes to be a caring profession to provide the care that, that is needed to make nursing effective. So this was sort of where we were coming from and that I was the executive director of the Nursing Now Global Campaign for, for the time it ran, three years. And one of our goals was to improve nurse leadership. And this seemed at first glance to be very logical because everybody who ever publishes a report on nursing wants to improve nurse leadership. 
But when you get right down to it, you've got to ask yourself, what exactly does that mean? What are we going to see if we improve nurse leadership? And why does it keep popping up? Um, and so one of the things that, that was emerging about nursing and was confirmed in 2020 is that nursing is 90% female. So the question in our minds was, what effect does it have um, that nurses are mostly women? And we applied IntraHealth, my uh, nursing now, um, we applied together to Johnson Johnson to get some funding to see if we could make some, uh, um, uh, get some opinion from our very large networks around the world about this question. So it was both about nursing leadership and nurses as women. Um, and so that's how this all began. And, and we are very grateful to J&J &J for beginning this journey with us and in fact continuing it. And uh, in particular to Lee Chun Mei, who has been a very um, critical friend along the way, not only representing J&J, &J, but interacting with us at every step. So we're very grateful to Lee Chun Mei uh, for that relationship and for everything it's taught us. And we've had other people along the way that we'll probably mention too, who've pushed us really into a fairly radical place when we're starting to look at this question, which we will talk about at the end. But now I'm going to ask uh, Constance Newman, who is an adjunct professor at UNC and my colleague for many years at IntraHealth, who is a really renowned global expert on gender and the health workforce. So I'm going to ask her to uh, present just a few of our findings. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. So... Um... Can you hear me? Yes, me? yes. Okay. okay, I don't know if you can see me, but I'm just going to start. So hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> and so in 2019, um, IntraHealth uh, International, uh, the Nursing Now campaign and Johnson & Johnson partnered on a study um, and a report, which is called Investing in the Power of Nursing, What Will It Take? And it explored certain gendered dimensions of nurse leadership, uh, surveying uh, and interviewing nurses, current and former nurses around the world. Now, this study um, heard from 2,537 male and female nurses from 117 countries in seven regions. <clears throat> and the study looked at, excuse me, <clears throat> gender bias and discrimination experienced as a nurse. Uh, sexual harassment, career progression, support for work and family responsibilities and leadership ach achievements <clears throat> and barriers to those. And that is the basis of the um, paper that is included in Creative Nursing. So the first thing I wanted to uh, say, or the results that I wanted to bring forward is that you've probably heard that, that the health sector is a, se a sex segregated sector in general. Uh, and Barbara pointed out that the state of the world's nursing um, found that 90% of nurses worldwide are female. So this is a highly segregated uh, profession in a, se a segregated sector. Um, and nursing, the profession of nursing faces intense stereotyping as we found in this study associated with, uh, um, with notions of femininity and masculinity. Nurses being the feminine side, doctors being the, the masculine side. Now you can see that this is already um, a good deal of stereotypical thinking. Um, the, 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 the study found that cultural beliefs about women's roles are a barrier to, to nurse leadership. Uh, and that we see this very clearly in, um, in the stereotypes that emerge. Um, there are both positive stereotypes and negative stereotypes of, of nursing. Um, you have a positive service orientation, one stereotype, but that somehow transmutes uh, to subservience, from service orientation to subservience. Whether stereotypes are positive, as in this conception of nurses as ministering angels, or negative, 
nurses are incompetent leaders, which came out of the, uh, the study. These are disempowering, positive and negative are disempowering stereotypes with respect to the common conceptions of assertive, decisive leadership. And you can take a look at that in the, in the paper. The second um, set of findings that we found have to do with the kind of leadership capabilities that need to be developed. Um, and the study found that there were a series of questions, a series of capabilities, um, and those that mattered a lot to the respondents included the highest percentages of, of responses were that being comfortable speaking your mind matters a lot to nurses. Knowing how to engage in policy formulation matters a lot. Knowing how to effectively advocate for a position mattered a lot. Having public speaking skills mattered a lot. Being able to identify or cope with various types of gender discrimination mattered a lot. And having confidence in the exercise of power mattered a lot. And this, so, so before, I just want to summarize um, that women um, nurses, female nurses face specific kinds of um, disadvantages, uh, even in a female dominated uh, profession. Um, and that there are aspects of the system that are discriminatory, um, that are sometimes out of the awareness of nurses, but we found in this study that nurses actually do perceive inequalities in terms of advantages and disadvantages. I would like to turn this now back over to Barbara, who will talk about uh, what it's gonna take, what is needed for nurses to become powerful leaders. Thanks so much, uh, Candy. So yes, just just uh, really to summarize, um, do read what we've sort of drawn from that. As I said at the beginning, we had some really interesting conversations with people, including Jane Salvage, Anne Marie uh, Rafferty, Julia Hallam, and Mary Beard, who writes on um, women and power. And this was one of the the, the foci that came out of this study was how you exercise power and interestingly that also came out of the nursing now campaign because what we found was that nurses together and we were in 126 countries together became very powerful because they became a force that could be seen so the individual narrative of nursing became the joint narrative and that joint narrative became a, like a pressure group so it got the attention of policymakers, politicians. Um, and so we, we found that while nurses are, are the most trusted profession, they're often not the most influential at the moment because they don't build bridges to policy. So that's what we feel um, uh, is, is embedded in this idea of, of helping or supporting nurses to be better leaders is that we want to link them to where they can make a difference uh, to policy. And I think the second thing I would say is it's always approached this idea of developing nurse leadership as if the nurses are the flawed players and they've got to be changed. It's not the nurses who are the flawed players, it's the systems which are really weighted towards um, men being promoted, towards valuing male traits in leadership, um, in, in the health sector in many, many parts of the world. So what nurses, um, what would really make a difference, I think, and, we, and this is where I say this is a continuing journey because we're about to embark on another study um, to look at competencies in leadership in nursing and what we really mean by then. Nurses have to learn to be a bit more difficult, a bit more savvy about politics, about disruption, and about gender and where they stand, you know, in relation to uh, their male colleagues and get their, their male colleagues on their side. Um, we know that care and power can go together. Of course they can, um, but nurses have to learn to do that, we believe. So back over to you, Marty. Thank you so much, Barbara and Constance. I would like to point out in the chat, uh, Dr. al Sadi has said in Jordan, it's interesting that male nurse numbers are increasing to the extent that some universities in Jordan took some actions. 
to balance that. So I would love for you guys to talk to each other after after this session and and find out more about about that. So um, now I'm pleased to introduce Christine Hurdle, PhD, OTRL, FAOTA. She's a professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota. She will name her co-author and present Perceived Impact of a Relationship-Based Care Curriculum. Thank you, Marty, and thank you. It's an honor to be here. And yes, I am maybe the outlier here in that I am an occupational therapist by trade, um, but I'm also a I have also a psychology background as well. Uh, so I worked with one of our students and I got to um, know creative healthcare management as one of my former students actually worked for creative healthcare management and a current student then um, conducted her graduate studies. And that, that student's name is Alex Theismann, who is my co-author. And what she studied, um, and we studied through a phenomenal, phenomenological um, uh, study, and we actually uh, used uh, uh, data analysis for both inductive and deductive um, analysis in looking at the themes and what we were looking at in relation to sub questions. We studied what is the perceived impact of see me as a person curriculum from the facilitators perspectives. And for those who do not know, see me as a person was authored by Mary Colorudis, who has been involved with uh, CHCM many years and was CEO and still is involved, I believe, as well as Michael Trout. And this uh, research question had a number of sub questions, which I don't have time to go into because I know we are short on time. But what we found in uh, working with the facilitators, and I want you to think about this. We, we were looking at relationship-based uh, curriculum prior to the pandemic. And so uh, one of the premises of this is there might have been more time uh, for organizations as we've talked to people since to e even spend some time really focusing on this. And See Me as a Person is a curriculum that um, would hold workshops and consult with, and many of you probably know this, large healthcare institutions and also other companies in implementing a curriculum that focuses on relationship-based care. The deductive findings found out that the concepts which are attuning, wondering, following and holding were not considered rocket science, but they were often things that people would forget about in their day-to-day -day care of clients or patients um, because uh, sometimes the actual act of the nursing care uh, became priority. And I imagine that is probably even more so during the pandemic. They also talked about the fact that certain concepts were harder to follow or to understand. So for instance, following requires quite a bit of therapeutic use of self, intuitive nature of understanding what's going on in the relationship. And so that might take a little bit more practice than some of the other key concepts. And so some of the uh, practice areas were uh, considered a little bit more difficult than others. The actual delivery was often in person and there were many hands-on activities, which was seen as a positive. Now in talking with members of the organization after, because I was interested in, in how they pivoted, it does sound that there have been, uh, like there's been some efforts to um, pivot so that they could uh, adapt to the needs of the pandemic. And I, I would love, it would be great to do a follow-up <laughs> just to find out how this has changed during the pandemic. Uh, we were occupational therapists coming in, and we also uh, discussed with individuals the fact that many of these workshops were involving uh, dif different dif disciplines. And the interdisciplinarity was seen as a, a positive um, because sole professions often might uh, fall into one area or a, a way of thinking. And so multiple disciplines would bring multiple um, perspectives. And so I think that that's important for all of us to kind of uh, think about and remember is that importance of the interdisciplinarity. Uh, also, uh, the process of attunement to the client and the wondering were seen as a key focus of that uh, therapist or nurse client relationship. 
There were many ideas brought up to enhance the curriculum. However, some of those ideas would have to be considered uh, based on how the organization has pivoted since then. A couple other things I think are of importance is that the culture of the organization is integral to relationship-based care. So one or two leaders that believe in relationship-based care was not sufficient. It had to permeate through the entire organization and a key leader had to, um, had to have people under the leader um, believing in this. Yet too, if the leader left, if there was new leadership that did not support this, then often maintaining relationship-based care cultures became more difficult. And I think that that's really important. Um, overall, it was very interesting because the facilitators felt that just teaching the concepts of relationship-based care um, impacted them positively, not only professionally, but also in their personal relationships. And I know there has since been uh, another book on relationship-based cultures uh, by CHCM. And there's also a look at how do we take this practice into our own lives. And the facilitators felt very strongly that no matter the experience of somebody, that we can all be taught to be better caregivers or therapists or nurses. Okay. A couple last things, the inductive uh, findings uh, talked about the importance of redefining cultural norms. And I know this has been talked about since the pandemic as well. And that many felt vulnerable going into these workshops, but felt empowered coming out of them. And so, so I, I think that's important as well. And that there was personal transformation uh, and uh, an awareness of personal biases. Uh, right now, I've talked uh, to a couple of people at CHCM. One of the concerns is quantifying uh, the impact of these workshops uh, because it's perhaps a little bit easier to uh, qualitatively take a look at the workshops. And I also believe uh, there's a real opportunity now that we've had the pandemic. And I am gonna close with a sentence that we close our article with. Connections with others is the basis of humanity. As healthcare professionals, we need to re uh, maintain intentional practice for our patient practice practitioner relationships, and I would also say in our relationships with each other and with our colleagues and coworkers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. And I want to assure you, you're not an outlier. Yours is the third article by an occupational therapist that we've published in the last, I'd say, two or three years. So you're always welcome. I'm now pleased to introduce Mohammed Al-Sadi, RN, PhD, Assistant Professor on the Faculty of Nursing at Zarqa University, Zarqa, Jordan. He will name his co-authors and present Readiness-Based Implementation of Electronic Health Records, a Survey of Jordanian Nurses. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear me all. And I apologize for any technical errors that happened uh, at the beginning of this meeting. Um, actually, I'm using my phone now to, uh, to attend the meeting and present my, uh, my article with the co-authors. Um, uh, well, um, the, the story of this article started, or this study actually started um, 10 years ago, I guess. I used to work for um, a national program in Jordan where we started to implement a national initiative for an electronic health record system. Um, it's based on veterans affairs technology, and it was an initiative to start uh, the EHR system across the whole country. Now, during the implementation, uh, we faced many challenges with the healthcare workers about their acceptance to the technology, how they can use it, about their adoption to the technology, and how they realize its benefits. Um, the, the major concern was there is the readiness for change and how much the nurses and other healthcare workers are ready for change. And because I'm a nurse, I focused on nurses. So I was helping them, teaching them, tra training them, uh, getting everything ready for them. But I felt there is still something missing. There's a gap in their readiness. 
to accept technology. And I feel that we should uh, go for some kind of a limit for that technology. And this article came up to study that. Uh, me and my colleagues, they are um, from two universities in Jordan, the University of Zarqa and uh, the University of Jordan. It's the mother university in Jordan. So um, we came up with this uh, article and the results showed that nurses are moderately, or say conservatively ready for implementing technology. But uh, they understand the benefits of it. Uh, they adopt it, they use it, but uh, there's something missing in their readiness to accept that technology. Um, in this article, we came to a conclusion uh, or quotes, let's say, that focus on that nurses is actually um, uh, uh, caring science, it's a caring profession, and we should not rely too much on digital technology or let's say robotics or some kind of uh, too much technology in caring for patients. So we should focus more on maybe the caring science itself. The other thing is um, in, in order to make nurses or other healthcare workers ready for any technology, we suggest to develop some kind of um, a nationwide or a large scale change management program, which we do actually. At the project we worked with, we did actually have that change management program, but still uh, there is a lot to do, a lot more to do. And we should maybe investigate uh, maybe the relationship between nurses and technology more to decide what is enough of technology for us to be in the healthcare system as a total and especially for nurses. Um, and I will share something with John that um, during my work with that company for five years, uh, during the implementation of the national based electronic system, I used uh, to lead the health analytics department. So uh, we were sitting on a database of five million records at one time. And that was back in the days, like uh, seven years ago. So uh, <laughs> I, do, I do know more about uh, predictive analytics and I, maybe I'd love to share some thoughts with you. Structural equation modeling was my next paper that I'm working on right now. And I use uh, SEM uh, to uh, do some kind of statistical analysis for the next paper I'm working on. Uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me. And uh, I would like to thank Marty for her support, continuous support. And thanks for Florida Atlantic University for giving me the chance to present this article briefly. Thank you very much all. Oh, and thank you. Sadi, it's just been such a pleasure. And I, I mean, your sentence about deciding what is enough technology is just wonderful. I'd now like to introduce Kimberly Hughes, DNP, RNC-OB-CNS. She is an assistant professor at the University of Texas Health Center at San Antonio. She'll name her co-authors and present Application of the Flipped Classroom Approach in an Undergraduate Maternal Newborn Nursing Course to Improve Clinical Reasoning. Uh, thank you very much. As mentioned, my name is Kimberly Hughes. My co-authors are Dr. Sarah Gill and Dr. Andrea Burnt. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm an assistant professor at University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio which is located on, on the ancestral home of the Coatec people of South Texas. I'm the course coordinator of Care of the Childbearing Family Theory course. And as was already mentioned, my paper entitled Application of the Flipped Classroom Approach in an Undergraduate Maternal Newborn Course to Improve Clinical Reasoning uh, describes a quality improvement project undertaken by my colleagues and myself to transition from a lecture-based format of teaching to an active learning format using the flipped flipped classroom approach. Um, nursing clinical courses are historically where students learn to apply theory to practice, which improves clinical reasoning and the ability to, to think like a nurse. But due to dwindling clinical experiences, we wanted to incorporate clinical reasoning opportunities within the theory class. We conducted a, a literature review and, and identified several ways to apply the flip, flipped classroom format but the one constant was pre-class preparation followed by in-class application of the content. Outcome measures were primarily student performance and student satisfaction. Barriers included lack of understanding and resistance to change, as well as frustration behind the necessity of pre-class work on the part of the students. And facilitators were voiceover PowerPoints or videos in addition to readings for, for pre-class preparation 
as well as time and IT support for the faculty in order to transition from lectures to active learning experiences. Based on literature review, we decided to measure student performance via the Assessment Technologies Institute Maternal Newborn Exam, as our institution uses ATI to help determine student mastery of content. And we measured student satisfaction via the end of course evaluations. We transitioned from lectures to unfolding case studies on the topics of pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and newborn care. Students worked in groups to determine appropriate nursing interventions at different points in time using patient histories, pictures, diagrams, and fetal monitor strips, for example. Students answered open-ended questions on safety, assessment, prioritization of care, and patient educational needs. The transition was a process and took us three semesters to complete. It took additional time to transition the more content heavy lectures to case studies, as we first needed to discuss and determine what concepts were really important for the generalist nurse to understand because we just couldn't include everything. But by the end of the third semester, all classes were presented using the flipped classroom approach. The active learning principles took more time because we had to have time for student uh, discussion and deliberation when we uh, proposed the open-ended questions to them. The ATI exam and the course evaluation results were uh, reviewed each semester and compared to the baseline assessment prior to the practice change. And we found the student performance on the maternal newborn ATI exam really showed no statistical difference in scores across the semesters, but the student's self-rating of their ability to understand and apply the information on, on a Likert scale increased each semester. We also reviewed the students' open-ended comments on the course evaluations each semester, and the overall tone of the first semester was overwhelmingly negative, even though the comprehension and application of content scores had improved. Students really didn't understand the active, didn't understand active learning and felt that they were teaching themselves. So the faculty had to incorporate a short explanation about active learning principles and their in, in their importance in nursing care. And we found that in subsequent semesters, the negative comments decreased and the positive comments increased. We continued to revise our presentation of case studies slightly each semester based on the feedback from the students. The maternal newborn course was successfully transitioned from an all lecture to an all flipped classroom um, class. And although students resisted the change at first, each cohort accepted the change more readily and had improved confidence in their ability to apply the knowledge to the care of patients. And I'll end with this. Nursing is a dynamic profession. Students can't memorize everything they'll need to know to provide care to any patient that they may come in contact with. And nursing faculty can't teach students everything about the care of all patients. Therefore, we need to, students, we need to foster students' ability to clinically reason or think like a nurse in order to determine appropriate solutions, even if they find themselves in unfamiliar situations. Thank you. Amen to that. The, we know the days when you could learn everything in nursing school, if, they're, if they ever were there, are no longer. So thank you so much, dear. So I am now pleased to introduce Dennis Demetz, MCS, I'm sorry, MSC RN. Dennis is a lecturer, a researcher, and doctoral student at Regia University at Brussels. Dennis is co author of an article also about mental health care in an upcoming issue of Creative Nursing, which the, the name of the issue is Thinking Like a Nurse Making an Impact on Family and Society. Dennis will name his co authors and present Nursing Students' Attitudes, Future Role, and Knowledge Regarding Euthanasia Due to Unbearable Mental Suffering, a Single Site Pilot Study. Hello uh, from Brussels, it's good evening to everyone. Um, and otherwise in the US, it's good afternoon. Mm -hmm. So I'm Dennis, my co-authors are Dr. Sandra Tricasaras and Dr. Johan Bilsen. Um, it might seem a bit uh, weird, this topic, but Belgium is one of the few countries where euthanasia is legal. And so uh, we do think it's important to uh, prepare our students for this practice. Um, and even a bit more um, um, typical for Belgium, Belgium is one of the four countries worldwide where you can request for euthanasia uh, because of non-terminal suffering. 
So as it is for uh, people with a psychiatric illness or psychiatric disease. So that's why we found it important to prepare our students. And so since 2002, it is legal in Belgium. Um, we have like a rather large number about two th last year, no, 2020, around 2,600 people have received or have got euthanasia. Um, but the percentage of the one who uh, got euthanasia because of unbearable mental suffering um, is around uh, 50. So it's around 2% of all euthanasia. Most euthanasia acts are because of terminal cancer. Um, it's not so easy to uh, get euthanasia. There's a whole process um, um, in front of getting the euthanasia. Um, by law, it's only stated if there is um, a nursing team, the doctor should consult this nursing team. So by law, this is the only role for the nurse in practice. Um, the nurse, um, depending on the ward or the hospital where the nurse is, um, the role will be uh, mostly um, accepting or hearing the question from the patient. So just hearing it and exploring the, the question and then um, give this question to the, um, to the multidisciplinary team. Um, as well as preparing the medication to uh, placing the drip um, and of course the aftercare. And so we were um, thinking about how is this fit for nursing students? So because in, in scientific research and literature, you can find some uh, articles about the attitudes of nursing students, but mostly it's in countries where euthanasia is not legal. And all of them are on euthanasia because of terminal suffering. Um, so we had this idea, so that's why it's a single side study. So my PhD is about this UMS euthanasia, so variable mental suffering euthanasia. And we were uh, thinking, um, will we uh, go uh, deeper in to the psychiatric nurses, which was the first pilot study, or will we have a look at general nurses and compare them with the psychiatric nurses, which was the second pilot study, and the third one was the nursing students. And after all, we decided we will go further with the nursing students. Um, so, what were the ideas of the, the nursing students? So, they had a, a high acceptability towards UMS euthanasia. Um, they had no, not really a problem like, is it ethical or is it not ethical? Um, is it something, um, is it a um, is it a, a, no, it's not like a good thing, it's like, is it um, um, appropriate, perhaps a better word, um, for patients to ask for euthanasia and can they get them? So in general, the attitudes were quite, excited, so euthanasia was acceptable to them. Um, in their role, they see a role for themselves in the decision-making process. So they do think like a nurse can, um, discuss a euthanasia request with a patient, and then they say the nurse has to pass the question to the multidisciplinary team. But I think the primary nurse so, um, has a, an, an, a very important role in the decision making process. Um, some are willing to prepare the medication, but once uh, it's like the placement of the drip or administering the lethal drugs. They don't think it's a role for the nurse. And so in aftercare, so the aftercare for the family of the patients, they do think the nurse has a role as well. So, and I guess it's uh, it's the same all over the world. Our, all our nursing students are um, very well prepared in uh, technical skills, but the students, they, um, they said in the study, like we do not feel confident to, to handle a euthanasia request. Um, although that's some, a number I know now, but not at that time in the, in the major study of, of my PhD, we uh, questioned all Flemish um, 
final year nursing students. And so they said 56% of them um, have already been in contact with euthanasia. It could be as a nursing student in the hospital, it could be in a, in a, a private uh, environment. So we didn't uh, define that, but like, just have you ever been involved in euthanasia during internships or privately? 56% of them. I do think it's a large number. So, um, and so um, they said like, we do need more skills in communication. We do need, we do need more theoretical skills. And perhaps it can be an idea to uh, develop a simulation, a simulation education specifically towards the euthanasia request. Um, and that's why in the large study, we did not only do a questionnaire, but as well focus groups to get a better insight in this, uh, in this matter, this specific matter for Belgians, uh, Belgians, the Netherlands and Switzerland to be more specific. Um, and so um, taking uh, taking care of nurse to do to do the topic of the journal. Um, yeah, I'm a bit nervous right now. I don't know why. <laughs> um, impact of caring. So in sometimes um, to take care of the patient in a, in a very um, limited situations, sometimes taking care of the patient can be a way to support him, him or her, to support the patient in the wish to, uh, to stop the pain and the suffering. Well, thank you, Dennis. I, when Dennis first reached out to me about this article, I, I never will forget your email said, this is a very intense topic, and I would say a very heartrending topic. And he said, I understand some journals may not wish to touch this. We said we will not only will we touch it, we will publish it and we, and we have so we were very grateful for your article, Dennis. Thank you so much. So now I am going to present two articles and I'm going to begin by telling you that I am speaking from here in Minneapolis. The Mississippi River is right outside my window, and I live on the ancestral land of the Dakota people and a land over which the Anishinaabe people also moved. That's, that is where I am. I'm going to present two articles. It's currently just after 1130 Thursday night in Tehran, Iran. So I am glad to present in their stead the latest in a series of fine scholarly articles from colleagues in Iran. This article by Mariam Tofigi, a faculty member in the Department of Nursing at Isfahan University of Medical Sciences and her colleagues, Batul Tergari, Zora Gomenian, Mehdi Safari, Jafar Bazyar, Esan Mohammadi, Leila Malekian and Hamid Safarpur, who is the corresponding author. Hamid's name is the one that's in that list is about skills possessed by effective head nurses. Head nurses have a direct impact on patients, families, direct caregivers, physicians, and the multidisciplinary team, and are therefore poised to lead changes in healthcare delivery. Time is a valuable commodity in life, and the development of other resources depends on the presence and availability of time. The basic steps in successful time management are to set realistic goals, get organized, delegate, relax and recharge, and stop feeling guilty. That's what these authors say. Controlling time can prove, improve managerial abilities and human resource management, reduce stress, and ultimately increase job satisfaction and improve mental health among managers. Time management skills are essential for the development of clinical competence in nursing. Time that is not spent with the patient can have a negative impact on the quality of care. An effective variable associated with time management is emotional intelligence, defined as a subset of social intelligence that includes the ability to monitor one's feelings and the feelings of others, discriminate among them, and use this information to guide thinking and actions. Empirical evidence suggests that emotional intelligence has a strong relationship with emotional social success, including more positive affect, 
higher self-esteem, higher satisfaction with life, social interaction, and well-being. The authors of this article study these two variables, time management and emotional intelligence, among head nurses in emergency and intensive care units. They conclude that specific emotional intelligence and time management skills may help head nurses cope with the challenges they face with a goal of improving the quality of nursing care. Nursing leaders should consider the importance of time management and emotional intelligence in increasing motivation and satisfaction of nursing staff and improving quality of care and should allocate resources accordingly. So please read this entire article to learn more about how these authors examine these aspects of the head nurse role and its impact on caring. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's currently just after 3 a.m. Friday morning in Jakarta, Indonesia. So I'm honored to present in their stead the latest in a series of valuable scholarly articles from colleagues in Indonesia. It's about participatory action research, a method of inquiry that promotes a collaborative approach to knowledge creation. In contrast to conventional social science research, methods, participatory action research transforms social inquiry from a linear causal approach to one that is intimately intertwined with the complicated daily experiences of those being studied. Pardon me. <coughs> Participants in studies can be involved in designing the study, recruiting and selecting participants, gathering, analyzing, and interpreting data and disseminating results. I really have to apologize for, <coughs> I'm so choked up by this art. <coughs> I'm thinking that perhaps it might be better <clears throat> if we um, have the next presenters speak while I recover my voice. And so the next presenters, if you are ready, Suzanne Clear, are you ready to present now? Yes, Marty, I am. Okay, Please. I really apologize. So let me introduce you. Suzanne is a professor of nursing at Lawrence Technical University in Southfield, Michigan. She and the colleagues are also co-authors of an article all show about relationship-based care in the next issue of Creative Nursing. She will name her co-authors and present What's Love Got to Do With It? Teaching the Next Generation of Nurses. Suzanne? Thank, yes, thank you, Marty, and please take care of that voice. <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone else that is on the call with us today. It is a real pleasure to be uh, on this journey in transforming what I see is our current landscape um, of our profession of nursing. My colleagues and co-authors, Dr. Margaret Glombaki, Mr. Brian Kaminsky, and Dr. Therese Jamison, who is also our founding director of our nursing program, have had a unique opportunity to address the challenges that exist in this current landscape. Our paper is a descriptive offering a sharing of our history of how we've embraced love as a court in education and our hopes for the future of love. The backstory or our why is related to a decades old disconnect, a disconnection between the theory that we teach and the practice that we see. Now, what we talked about here and what each of us embraces is not necessarily what is purported to be in actual care that happens in healthcare systems around the world. Rather, it's a robotic approach with attention that is focused on technical competencies. There is this myth that caring theory is academic and it doesn't translate to what happens or even needs to happen in healthcare. More attention is paid or should be paid because little happens now to the relational competencies that these patients that we serve expect from nurses. 
So this is the spark that ignited this particular baccalaureate of nursing program. The academic program was created to not only address the gap, but to blow it up and to build a new path where new nurses, the nurses that will care for my loved ones and myself are armed with resilience as well as the relational and technical skills that are essential to truly great authentic care. So in 2015, a faith-based healthcare system and a private university came together to do just that. An academic partnership was formed, students enrolled in this unique program. And the uniqueness of it is the full immersion that students have in a shared conceptual model of relationship-based care and those caring sciences that underpin this important model. So our journal article captures these efforts and the methodology that we used in the developmental phase, as well as the implementation phase. And the implementation phase is ongoing. It is the curriculum. It is the ever evolving, expanding curriculum uh, with attention paid to what's important. Relationship-based care is found in every course. Now this uniqueness that I mentioned is the early introduction of the who and the why of nursing. This affords students as entering freshmen first semester to experience authentic caring relationships, as well as a healing environment. The methodology um, that we utilized was I2E2, developed by Jane Felgen, who's with us today. That methodology keeps us laser focused on the vision that we have of creating loving leaders at the bedside. The vision infuses every single thing that we do. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the I2E2 model, our article traces our work using the model as the frame of our presentation. It's a change methodology, changing how nurses are prepared for practice. And this required this structured approach. So it begins with our vi vision, the foundation, for our change, changing how nurses are educated and how we sustain that. You know, how do we sustain this appreciation and knowing about what love means in human caring? Our vision supports every step of what we do and of the model itself. Our first in this model is the first I and it is inspiration and as it implies this step is all about articulating things in such a way that we are invited to be engaged. This vision is what inspired faculty to join our program, why people left private practice, uh, their own businesses, to be a part of something that's new and different. The second I in the model is infrastructure, which is our framework, and it supports building relationships. When we talk about building relationships, it's not just between the students and the faculty. It's also between faculty, as well as between the students, the students in their own cohorts and across cohorts. Infrastructure lives in every one of our courses and is seen in the objectives for those courses. Education is the first E in this change model. And it's focused, I'm sorry, it is not focused solely on students and their development. This includes the need for faculty who need to build their own capacity in the fluid language of caring and the behaviors of what caring is. So we have to walk the walk and talk the talk, but in a way that is comes from the heart and the core of who we are and is just not a nod to what we are about. The second I is evidence. And this is found in both upstream and downstream evidence or um, data. Our downstream evidence is measurable in our graduate nurses, our caring scholars who understand the importance of relational as well as technical competencies. Now our upstream evidence 
is found in each course, in our course objectives, in our deliverables, that which the students um, are assigned as a, to demonstrate their mastery of the material. And it's also seen in the student evaluations that are gathered in each course. We have graduated that first cohort, those students who entered in 2017. I'm proud to say that the vast majority have taken positions with our academic partner. We look forward to examining the data from subsequent cohorts and the impact that they are having on this nursing landscape, this landscape of love for humankind. So we thank you uh, for your attention to our work. I love that term too, the landscape of love. Oh my God, we got all kinds of great terms here. I'm going to say, uh, Holly Wu, would you like to go next and uh, present your review? Does that work? So I'm yes. proud to introduce Holly Wei. I'm sorry, I, I mispronounced Holly Wei, PhD, RN, CPN, NEA BCFAAN. She's a professor and assistant dean for the PhD program at the University of Louisville School of Nursing in Louisville, Kentucky, and is associate editor of the International Journal for Human Caring. She will present her review of the book Using Predictive Analytics to Improve Healthcare Outcomes. So, Holly. Oh, thank you so much, Marty. And I just feel like I'm so blessed to be in this um, among this uh, elite group here tonight. I feel like I feel energized now as a nurse, as a human being, as a caring nurse. And I really appreciate this opportunity. So hello, everyone. Greetings from Egypt. As Marty said, you know, uh, there's uh, the 9, 11 o'clock in uh, Iran and some other time in uh, other countries. So actually I am in Egypt right now visiting some universities here. And after this meeting, I will uh, head to the Cairo airport and go back to the US. Um, so I am uh, Holly Wei, a professor and assistant dean for the PhD program uh, at University of Louisville. It's a great pleasure and honor to join this group of scholars here. And thank you very much, Marty, for this opportunity uh, to contribute this issue of the journal and the Florida at Atlantic University for hosting this event. So in this issue, I got a, a great opportunity to review a wonderful book um, titled uh, Using Predictive uh, Analytics to Improve Health Care Outcomes. And with the editors being uh, John Nelson, uh, Jane Felgen, and Marianne Hozak. Um, so predictive analytics is a, is a statistical an approach that can be used to study risks, to manage and wanted outcomes before they occur. Um, so basically the book outlines how predictive analytics can be applied to improve healthcare outcomes, which fits very well with this issue's purpose um, and thinking like a nurse intent and impact of caring. So I want to say that I just feel like I came to Egypt. I don't know the language. I, you know, I just, when I visit the nursing, a school of nursing, and I feel we have an international language already just being a nurse with a caring. So I really think this book also resonates that with a lot of international uh, global connections models John and the uh, other editors and contributors put in this book. And also this book also shows how quality data can motivate innovations in organizational structures and processes, improve quality of care and reduce healthcare cost. So what is quality, uh, quality data? Quality data are defined as a data derived from appropriate theories uh, proper measurement and well-designed data collection process. So in the hospital we have, we collect data all the time. So are we collecting data just to collect data or are we collecting data, quality data to use it to, to do something, make plans for the future? So that's what I really think the book will highlight. So instead of just asking nurses to do data collection to answer surveys, think wisely, what do we want to do? and how we design this in a way so we can use this and make action plans and to tell the stories about this data. 
So really high, highly recommend to look at this, um, I mean, look this article and uh, to see what the book is about. And quality improvement is vital to uh, healthcare outcomes, uh, including organizations, policies, cultures, professionals, uh, job satisfaction, performance, patient experience. Um, and John is, as Marty said, is a nurse statistician. It's very rare to find a nurse and a statistics in one and sometimes the statistician talks we don't even this all beyond our head i don't even know what they were talking about sometimes so being a nurse john was able to really talk at the nurses level what is this steps one two three four so actually the book listed the 16 steps to do a, a quality data and analysis um, so with the, the time being uh, short, I just want to see this book has uh, four sessions and 18 chapters. Um, the first ones with the data theory, operations and leadership, a lot of leadership and the session two about analytics in action to see how we can apply theories into practice. We talked about this a lot today and section three about refining uh, theories to improve measurement. Session four, international models uh, to construct, uh, uh, to study construct globally. So I really think these, the, just the three major strengths of the book I want to highlight is making the invisibles visible. We always see caring, caring, caring. So I really think caring, how can we make it it's invisible visible? So this book will highlight that, you know, the hermeneutics and uh, hard science, soft science, we all know that. How can we make it this soft science not so called soft to show and sp specifying the steps of quality improvement and using data to tell story and also uh, actionable uh, plan. In summary, um, the using a predictive analytics to improve healthcare outcomes offers practical tips and strategies to improve quality data collection and management. It insightfully in, integrates data ana analysis and dissemination from the predictives of re relationship-based care models and care theories to practice. Um, I really like Marty's quote of, uh, of John, the strong, strongest of the predictor. Now we really talk about predictor. Is it the caring? Is it, that's at the bottom line, the culture of caring. I really appreciate it. I hope you can read this article for details. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Holly, and thanks for doing this review. Yeah, the, you know, the buzz right now is you don't change behavior with information, you change behavior with stories. And that is the essence of this book. It's the stories of the people that we are studying. Please share the reference of the book. It's, it's, in, the, it's, it's in the issue of the journal. Um, but actually, Holly, do you have time to type it in the chat, the, the title of the book? Yes, I will do okay, that. Thank you. In the mm -hmm. few minutes that are left, I recovered <laughs> from my whatever it was. And I want to quickly tell you about this last article because it is so wonderful. And please do go and read the whole thing. <clears throat> the title of the article is The Utility of Participatory Action Research in the Nursing Field, a Scoping Review. The authors are Christiante Effendi and her colleagues from Indonesia. <clears throat> Participatory action research is particularly suited to nursing concerns because of its roots in the social sciences and organizational transformation literature. It is an important approach for nurse researchers who are enthusiastic about knowledge construction that inspires interpretations about the systems, nature of health. The concepts of emancipation and education also coincide with the concepts of health promotion described as enabling people to enhance their ability to control and improve their health. The approach is emphasis on collaboration, involvement, giving voice, and empowerment aligns with the central goals of women's health research, a growing area of interest in nursing research, and can respond to concerns about modifying the organizational structures in which nursing is done. Thus, the participatory approach includes researchers working with marginalized groups and on health inequalities. Increasing numbers of researchers adhere to a partnership instead of a dominator perspective on human relationships.
In this article, the authors highlight areas of improvement that such approaches might offer to researchers and scientists in the nursing field, including areas in which university-based researchers must overcome lengthy and thorny histories of exploitive and damaging research methods and where participatory strategies are especially important. The findings demonstrate how researchers are incorporating participatory principles into a variety of areas of nursing research. Participatory approaches to data processing and interpretation were found in over 60% of the articles assessed along all content categories. In order to pursue meaningful participatory action research, fully including participants and designing to include reciprocal benefits are essential. As one example, an article postulated the role of a discussion tool that allowed choices for people with dementia by focusing on abilities instead of deficits. What, what a concept. I encourage all of you to seek out this humane, insightful article about doing research in ways that are intimately intertwined with the complicated daily experiences of those being studied. So in the last few minutes, I would just like to remind everyone that uh, the information about how to access these articles and how to reach out to the authors is in the chat. So I'll give the last few minutes back to the folks from Florida Atlantic University to say their goodbyes. Thank you, Marty. And this is Shirley Gordon again. And I want to thank all of you for joining us in the spirit of promoting and disseminating caring science. In summary, this event and the journal issue are grounded in the assumption that the science of caring is crucial to the future of nursing. And I agree with Holly that I am feeling energized. I've been I'm spending an hour, an hour and a half with kindred spirits. And I want to reach out to all of you and learn more about the work that you're doing. I also want to thank the authors for sharing their understanding of thinking like a nurse as we explored um, diverse caring based practice topics, living caring and teaching strategies and curricula designs, and caring for our research participants to the integration of caring based research designs. The Christine E. Lynn College of Nursing at Florida Atlantic University is grateful for this opportunity to host the event and to come to know the editors of Creative Nursing and the authors of this important issue dedicated to, to caring science. And I invite you to reach out to us if you have interest in any of our programming. And I look forward to following your work. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending. I'm gonna stay on till everyone else has left, but God bless you all. Safe travels wherever you are and stay safe and well. Goodbye everyone.